thank you for coming to today's session, uh, uh, Reshaping the Eco-Evolution, uh, Harnessing AI's Power for Environmental Advancement in Canada. And I'd just like to do a few introductions. Uh, I'm Leroy Bannock. I'm a partner at f and Management. I've been in the environmental industry for about 30 years. About half my career as a hydrogeologist working on contaminated site projects, and the other half uh, working as a corporate consultant to the industry. And uh, I'd like to talk about our panelists, just a quick introduction. Uh, we have Russ Erickson here. Russ has spent over 25 years um, uh, in the industry and technology, and he is with um, the uh, Alberta Machine Intelligent Institute. Uh, Affectionately known as Amy. Uh, Amy is an Alberta non, uh, an Alberta-based nonprofit institute that supports world-leading research in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and translates scientific advancement into industry adoption. And we also have uh, Zoya Sodi. Uh, Zoya leads projects that tackle urban and environmental challenges across Canada. Europe, Southeast Asia, and is a senior program manager at Evergreen Canada. Evergreen is a national nonprofit, uh, works with environmental executives across Canada, and AI was a big conversation. And a lot of times there's a lot of confusion around AI. Everyone's used, it seems most people have used ChatGPT, see how it um, uh, works in their environment, but more globally, they're, they're kind of maybe, I don't want to say misunderstanding, but they're curious on, on what can AI do. So I thought I would start with a little quote by um, uh, Mustafa Suleiman, and he was one of the co-founders and heads of uh, DeepMind AI, and DeepMind was purchased by Google a number of years ago. And um, I just wanted to, you to listen to his kind of comment on what the tool of AI can do for us, especially when we're looking at environmental advancement. It's going to be the tool that helps us tackle all the challenges that we're facing as a species, right? We need to fix water desalination. We need to grow food 100 x cheaper than we currently do. We need renewable energy to be you know, ubiquitous and everywhere in our lives. We need to adapt to climate change. Everywhere you look, in the next 50 years, we have to do more with less. And there are very, very few proposals, let alone practical solutions, for how we get there. Training machines to help us as aides, scientific research partners, inventors, creators is absolutely essential. And so the upside is phenomenal. It's, it's enormous. Now, Mustafa has very good experience when it comes to that upside. So when Google um, brought in uh, DeepMind, um, what had happened is uh, they applied DeepMind to Google's cooling centers. So D Google has these massive data centers. And the cooling, um, I think someone was telling me this morning that some, it uses more energy than, and carbon emissions in some transportation industries. That's how much energy they use for the cooling centers. So Google has their best engineer trying to plan and moderate the cooling. Well, they had DeepMind study the cooling patterns, energy usage, and then one day they turned on DeepMind and it took over the controlling of the cooling. What had happened, immediately the cooling costs and energy use were reduced by 40%. It was extremely dramatic. And if you research the paper online, it shows the graph of the day they turned it on and it just went down like that. It was quite amazing. So today in our, our panel, when we talk about reshaping the eco-evolution, there's um, two points um, and ideas we'd like to get across. First of all, we'd like to discuss the transformation um, or the transformative potential of AI. And we'd also like to explore how AI can be used to drive sustainable practices. And our two panelists today are going to address these. First, we're going to have Russ to come up and really discuss the first part. And then we'll have Zoya come up and give a practical example of where AI is deployed. So what I'm going to do is hand it off to Russ. Once he's done, he'll hand it off to Zoya. And then I'll come back to you for some questions for our panelists. Russ? Thanks. 
All right, I'm going to start off just by doing a quick little survey of the audience. Hands up if you don't mind. Who in the who here has actually like stuck a prompt into GPT to chat GPT and tried some? Okay, I figured that would be a very high percentage. If I say the words Q learning algorithm, anybody here know what I'm talking about? Okay. Good, so we're generally speaking talking to an audience that, uh, that, uh, that I'm not going to get in over my head with. I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm on the, on the, on the uh, business side of, of Amy. We talk, we talk a lot about the things that, <coughs> that we do. So I'm going to give you a little, who, who here actually has even heard of Amy, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, the Pan-Canadian AI strategy, um, anything along those lines? So it's, okay, a couple people. Which is great, so thank you. Um, so I'll give you a bit of kind of background of AI in Canada uh, as a starting point. So um, back, and, and in fact AI here in Alberta. Uh, it's not really well known in the general public, but, uh, but the University of Alberta in, in, in Alberta is, uh, is one of the leading AI research uh, centers in the world. In fact, um, Back in about 2002, we started uh, as a province investing investing in AI research at the at the University of Alberta, and we kind of started with a small research group there. And this is long before uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning was at all cool. Um, it was it was very very speculative that this was ever going to be anything um, interesting at all um, back in 2002. And we built this this research group um, within the University of Alberta up quite uh, quite a bit, and we've been, and we've gone beyond that. Uh, as well. So around 2017, the feds looked around and said, hey, wait a minute, we have some really interesting and, strong, and, and some core strengths in AI research in this country. Maybe we should put a little strategy behind it. It's, it had been largely ad hoc built up around in Edmonton, around uh, Rich Sutton, who's, the, who's, who's the, one of the godfathers of, of AI, in the, specifically in the area of reinforcement learning, around Jeffrey Hinton, name you'll probably have uh, read in the papers recently, uh, at, uh, at the University of Toronto, and around Joshua Bengio, who I guarantee you've heard, if you've read the papers at all, you've heard his name. Rich is not quite as out in the media as his two peers, Joshua and, uh, uh, and, and Jeffrey. Um, but there's there'd been all of this work going on in Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton, f f uh, funnily enough, for the longest period of time. And so the Fed said, well, let's put some money in behind that. Let's start investing, uh, expanding that research capacity, building the talent pool uh, to do that. So that's where, where um, Amy was kind of spawned out, out of that. So we're a nonprofit research institute that, that funds, the, that, 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 uh, that manages that money from, from the feds, um, supports a lot of the compute power for the research uh, that happens at the, at the U of A in particular, also at UBC, Simon Fraser University, etc. But it's all about attracting the best and the brightest AI talent in the world, and we've been very successful at that. We've been able to grow the research side. Um, and it's all about creating more talent uh, out of that so that we are able to, to create opportunities for that talent here in, uh, here in Canada. Um, we've been really quite successful at that, that side of it. What I will say is we remain one of the top uh, so the, at the University of Alberta, we're one of the top five global AI research institutes in the world. There's a, there is three Chinese institutes, funnily enough, you're not going to be surprised by that, that are, that, are, that are ranked ahead of us in terms of the quantity and quality of the research that comes out of them. And there's Carnegie Mellon in, uh, in the United States. Um, and then there's everybody else behind, that, that, is, that is after uh, on that front. So we have this really great strength on the research side. On the, you know, historically, and, and this is again a, a topic that's very, uh, uh, very, uh, very much in the in the in the media these days. Is we we have historically had a a very deep productivity gap, and that productivity gap in Canada keeps widening. Part of the reason for that is we have been great at research on in, on this, but we we have not been great at commercialization and putting that into, into practice. In fact, for the longest time, up until I would say a few years ago, a lot of the talent that we created through all, through all doing all of this research actually went somewhere else. Um, we're doing a lot better job of creating opportunities here in Canada and keeping that talent here in Canada. Um, kind of in, in the last couple of years, over 80%, for example, of our grad students have, have actually stayed in Canada as they came out. And we, that's largely because there is a lot more opportunity, which is great. So talking about that at a very, uh, very high level. So from, from that perspective, we're making progress in this, this area, but 
we still are, like at a macro level in the country, without question, we're not investing uh, across industries to near to the level that we would need to invest to really, A, close that productivity gap, and really take advantage of all of the great research that we continue to do in this country. So that's a challenge to the industries, all, or, all across the, all, all, all industries. Um, certainly there are many good, good counterexamples to that. There's no doubt about that. I'll talk about a few of them, in fact. Um, just to kind of go back to uh, kind of where what what we do. This is what we do. We we drive the leading edge of research on the on the on the academic and the and the research side, and we're very much about about. And you'll you generally hear me talking a lot about the transfer of knowledge, talent, and technology into industry adoption. Um, I'll talk about a couple of very specific projects, but I want to talk <coughs> quickly about kind of again the the general AI landscape um, and particularly a bit as it applies to um, as it applies to the environmental sector um, so I guess just a, about a month and a half ago we released a, a report uh, that I'll kind of cover the, the highlights of here just to, to kind of give a bit of that uh, that background it's we, we called it our top 12 trends everybody loves a list so we put it in a list um, from uh, uh, from from that perspective so um, I'd encourage you to, to go uh, go ahead and Read it if you go to impact.amy.ca. Um, lots of good, lots of good stories there. Lots of good case studies. Lots of uh, lots of interesting uh, um, anecdotes as well as some some references to some some core research which could be uh, could be interesting. So let's talk about top 12 trends. Well, you can't talk about the top 12 trends in the last year um, in AI without addressing the elephant in the room, which is ChatGPT. Um, everyone has tried it out. Has uh, has anybody here actually you know? got the pro version, is, is accessing the GPT core through APIs and have built your own interface and done, done, done something else with it? Okay, cool. Two, <laughs> excellent. So that number is gonna be a lot higher next year, I guarantee you, in, in every room in, in, the, in the country. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the really cool, um, cool things that JATGPT has really done is A, it has actually just elevated the conversation um, around AI in general, certainly in some, some ways that I'll get to around ethical AI and, and responsible AI uh, in that areas, but also it, is, it has made AI and a big chunk of what of all of that research that like so open mind for ChatGPT invested billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars in actually building the large language model in the first place. And they continue to invest heavily in, in, in making it even larger uh, from, from that perspective. What, what putting the chat, G, chat GPT interface on it and making it so, making it so accessible has really en enabled uh, like accessibility for, to, to, an, to a really strong AI tool to, a, to, a, to everybody almost. And it has enabled a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, of applications that you would have need, re needed really specialized um, talent and, and, ex and expertise 18 months ago to actually able to achieve some of those outcomes. You can actually do that with a relatively low, a much lower level of technical proficiency. So it's really opened up an ex a, a, a lot. And, and if you're not using, like, so fortunately, I see a lot of people have at least tried it. Um, if you're not using something along these lines in 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 terms in your in your uh, in your everyday work, you're probably going to be falling behind um, the, the the your peers and the rest of the in the rest of the world. It has, however, um, brought up a number of questions. So, ChatGPT originally, um, and this is a this has always been a theme for Amy. Ethical AI and responsible AI development has, has since since our inception has been a, a key part of it. We do a lot of research in this area as well. Um, in the area of um, what, what I want to say as well is ChatGPT is not, not the end all be all of all AI. It's one domain. It's one one part of, uh, it's, it's one area, it's a, it's a very sophisticated supervised learning model with, uh, with some, uh, with, with, that has done, had a lot of training uh, d done into it, and then they layered on some human, re human in the loop reinforcement learning uh, to actually make it less racist um, to, a, to a large degree. Um, but it is, it is a really powerful tool. Um, brings up a lot of the questions that keep, that, that, that keep, uh, Keep people up at night uh, in the in the in the area of, of ethical AI and uh, and you know the the whole you know ChatGPT was largely trained on the internet. The internet is a very very biased data set in in general, and just like 
If, if you've ever worked with any database anywhere, in any, in, in any way, shape, or form, you know that garbage in equals garbage out on the, uh, on, on the outputs. And uh, so that's a, so the, the data sets and bias in the data sets, understanding how to recognize bias in the data sets, putting frameworks into place to, to mitigate for bias in the data sets is really, really important to actually doing ethical AI. Um, that is important across the, the board. It is also important as you kind of dig into every industry and every, and every application uh, to some degree. It's also brought up a really, really, um, uh, a huge need for AI literacy. And I mean, I'm talking about AI literacy from from K to 12, from kids in kindergarten all the way through to executives and boards. Um, understanding, you know, understanding what are the implications of AI? What are the possibilities for AI? What are the, what are the things that you actually need to think about from, a, from an ethical perspective? And that AI literacy piece is a really big part of what we try to, we try to address in the, in the market through training, through, uh, through workshops, through uh, training uh, uh, all the way from you know, we trained about 38,000 people between a series of MOOCs and a, and a, and a lot of in-person uh, and a lot of, uh, lot of live instruction workshops in the, last, uh, in the last year. So there's a lot of opportunities to learn about, about this and we're not the only ones that are trying to address this. Our, our colleagues at Vector, our colleagues at Mila are also doing much of this, this stuff. So how do you actually, beyond Beyond the large language model and, the, and, and chat GPT, what are the, like, how do you actually take advantage of some of these other areas of, uh, of, of AI? Um, one of the key things is that you know, the, the talent to do this work, um, again, accessibility to large language models, definitely way higher than it was 18 months ago. Uh, everything else, you still need pretty highly specialized talent to be able to, to, uh, to do this. And that talent is still pretty scarce. Um, so. Yeah, I, I equate this a little bit to, you know, the AI right now is kind of uh, it, at a, it, 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 it is at a level that you know software development was back in about the mid '80s, where if you wanted to actually build a build a software application back in the mid '80s, you, you you needed somebody with a PhD in computer science that knew what they were doing because they had to build from first principles to a, to a large degree, right? Um, and there was very few of those people. There's, you know, a few thousand, few hundred thousand maybe, and that, that kept growing. Um, now, you're, now we're at the point in the software industry that there's like, there's, there's object-oriented programming, there's all kinds of, it, like there's graphical interfaces, there's all kinds of things that make it super, way easier. You do not need a PhD to, to write software programs, to, to, to build apps anymore. Um, and we're going that way. So ChatGPT is a step in that direction in the, in the AI space. But to do a lot of the work, you still need highly specialized talent, and it's pretty rare. We, we are doing our best to create more of that. Um, our, our colleagues around the world in research institutes and, and, and academic institutions around the world are doing, uh, doing their, their best to, to, to do that. But there's still probably you know, a few hundred thousand like really senior machine learning scientists in the world. Um, in a few years, that'll be a few million. In a few more years, that'll be tens of millions. And, but we're not there yet. There's, uh, the, um, <coughs> there, the, the talent to be able to do a lot of this work is still pretty scarce. Um, and a lot of it ends up at Meta and Google and, 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 face, and, and, uh, and Microsoft, for example. Um, inclusive AI, super important, again, again in the context of, of ChatGPT, but also um, but also in all, in, in all areas. I, like a diverse perspective on your data sets, a diverse perspective on your algorithms, a diverse perspective on what, the, uh, the, on what you're actually trying to, uh, to, to achieve is gonna be really important to actually achieving the best, the best outcomes. Um, <laughs> Deloitte put out, a, put out a report in the fall. In the last year, there's 670 AI startups. Um, in the, that started in the, in the in Canada, um, which is great because that's actually we're doing better um, on the startup side than we are uh, like on a per capita basis than than many of our than even the United States in that regard, which actually surprised the heck out of me, <laughs> but also gave me some uh, some some cause for optimism. There is a lot, and this is one of the reasons that a lot of our talent is actually staying home because there's actually a lot of opportunity for them to do so, which is a, which is a great thing. Um, this number seven industry adoption is probably the most important uh, one to, the, to, to everyone in the, in the room. So uh, 
is certainly their chat GPT has raised the game, raised the, raised the conversation. There are many, many, uh, many, many other applications beyond chat GPT that, uh, that, that we have. There's a lot of process optimization things that you can do that are not a large language model um, problem to solve. Um, I'll talk about a, a couple of those actually uh, quickly in a, in a minute. Um, engaged community, like this, the environmental profession, one of the most engaged communities in the world. There's a really huge opportunity to collaborate and, uh, and, and work, work together to find great technological solutions to some of the problems we, we, we solve. And you know, at the end of the day, social, social good for AI, um, we see this. Uh, we, we see this both. Uh, we see this both in industry. We see this across the, the spectrum, around how important it is for a. So you know, our our mission is AI for good and for all. That's that's actually our mission statement for at at, at the institute, and uh, and so we live this 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 piece uh, tremendously. Um, and this you know, this the group in this room I think also really looks to looks to that um, as a as a as a north star in in terms of what technology can do. Um, and the last three I'll touch on really quickly. Rapid innovation. I think everyone's seen that, and and everyone's a little bit afraid of it. But also, there's a tremendous opportunity that that is presented by the rapid innovation in AI that's happened over the course of the last. You know, actually, November 2022 was when it really when when people started paying attention when ChatGPT was that was was launched. For example, this is an area that you know we in we in the field have been banging the drum for a long time. So we're pretty happy that that OpenAI really raised the raised the game on on uh, on on that. So from that perspective, and then back to that AI education piece. Um, one of the things that we're doing um, at Amy in our partnership with the University of Alberta is we have a we, we're in the process of hiring. So we have 43 uh, research chairs, Canada CIFAR AI chairs um, uh, that are professors at the University of Alberta right now. Uh, a few more in some other institutes. We're expanding that by we're in the process of hiring 20 more. Um, and historically, those people those chairs have been in the computer science department doing kind of really fundamental core uh, research uh, on, on that area. In that area, we've, had, we've expanded a bit into, um, into uh, life sciences and, and, uh, and, and, and precision health over the last, uh, last kind of few years. Going forward for these 20 new chairs that we're recruiting, they're across all faculties. So they're not all in the computer science faculty, they're in the engineering faculty, they're in the environmental sciences faculty. So we have a, we have, we're, we're looking to bring um, and create, te create programs that are, and create teaching programs that are very much about creating that talent for, um, for both doing research in machine learning and earth and environmental scientists. That's actually one of the chairs that we're, one of the, prof the, the professorships we're looking to recruit right now. Um, and really bring expertise from, from, from the environmental sciences domain Combine it with the expertise from the machine learning domain and really achieve some great things. That's the uh, that's the the objective there. Um, I'll not talk about the pop sci too too much. It's kind of like it's obvious. There's a lot of AI. AI has been a key part of pop science, popular science for a long time. Um, you've seen it in pop science fiction. You see it in uh, you, you see it in the movies. You see it every you see it everywhere. It's you see AI being applied in to 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 create new music, which presents some interesting. Also, challenges um, on on that front. So, um, from from that perspective, I'm going to dive quickly. I think I got a couple more minutes here um, into a couple of case studies of uh, in terms of um, you know, <coughs> Leroy talked about uh, DeepMind uh, reducing their uh, their electricity uh, costs by half uh, when they uh, when they started to apply to applying some ML algorithms in their in their data centers in the in the power management system there. Um, that was actually also work, so Amy Fellows were involved in that work with DeepMind. We have a long-standing partnership with DeepMind um, on, on that front. And they, for, for a period of time, they, they, were, they had set up, and set up an office in Edmonton to basically recruit all of our, uh, all of our grad students uh, at, at that point in time. But this is a really interesting one. So this is a pilot uh, project. We've been working with, we, it's a, it's a not, not, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen super fast overnight um, because you have to collect a lot of data. You have to make a lot of investment. Um, in this particular case, we worked with a, with an organization, uh, an engineering company, ISL. They've, they've got a, 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 a subsidiary called ISL Adapt that we worked with on a pilot project out in uh, Drayton Valley at a water treatment uh, facility. Uh, started about three years ago, uh, and 
the whole objective was to take, take reinforcement learning, which has historically been a, a, a niche within, within the machine learning world, applied a lot to gaming in terms of trying to, to prove out some, some, uh, some algorithms and, and, improve, the, and improve performance, um, but use reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is a, is a domain of, of, of artificial intelligence where effectively you are, it's, it's, you don't, it's not, it's not, it's not training a systems to like understand what dogs look like. It's not. It's not. It's not supervised learning. It's not unsupervised learning. It's training a computer to react to its environment. Uh, so it's, it's to see what's happening in its environment and make decisions based on the rewards and the punishments that you are that you're training it on. So it's. Uh, so so think about it. I, my my really really and and if uh, if any of the academics heard me say this, they would probably um, not be very happy with me. But. Uh, not being an academic, I can, can say it. For me, it's Pavlovian conditioning for computers. It, it literally is. It's, uh, it, that, that is exactly how we train our, we train, like that's how people learn. Um, people learn from, from effectively making decisions and understanding the consequences of those decisions and changing those decisions as, as, it, is, as, as it is in the future. This, this domain is what is of, of, of artificial intelligence is what our particular strength is at the, at, uh, here, here in Alberta. It's where, we, it's, it's, it's where it was started. Was the, this whole field of reinforcement learning was started here um, by our chief scientific advisor, Rich, Rich Sutton, and, and kind of growing out from there. Um, and so it's, it's a really interesting uh, uh, it's a really interesting opportunity to look at process, like the different processes, and say, well, there's different decisions you can make along the along the, the line in a water treatment uh, in a water treatment facility. That's the, that's this particular case. Um, there's different decisions you make around uh, the amount of chemical you put in, the amount of electric, like electrical, uh, the, the the electrical um, uh, inputs, for example, um, based on what's coming in, what what's like what's the what's in the water coming in, and what's your objective coming out. So you can train. Uh, you can train systems to to to, <clears throat> to make those decisions automatically, um, as, instead of having to have somebody like dip test and then like every few hours adjust the uh, adjust something. If you can if you can make those uh, if you can set up so your sense you're collecting the data on a in a real time basis, you can make the decisions around what you need need to do it on do it on a real real time basis. And in the initial phases of that pr that pilot project also brought. The, the electricity costs of that plant and the chemical costs of that plant down by 50%. And that's just the starting point. So like if you can think of, if you can save half of your water, water treatment costs um, on, a, on a global scale, that's, that's, that's billions of dollars of, of value that you can create through, through, a, through, a, through machine learning and, and approaching that. Um, the, that, that was the initial objective. Now we're, it's, it's created also new startup opportunities. So there's a, a startup company that's kind of come out of this. We're working with an organization called, um, called well, Google.org. So they're, it's, it's one of their, it's a nonprofit or it's, a, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation um, <coughs> within, within Google, Google, within Google to, to fund the effectively creating an autonomous agent to do this. So, uh, so the first step is understanding how to, how to make it work. The next step is actually deploying it into like rural water treatment facilities so that you've got, um, so, you, so that you've got an ability to, uh, to do that without having to have all of that high, that, that's, that highly skilled um, workforce on site everywhere uh, to really manage it. Um, another really interesting case study work with um, Alberta Wildfire, Canada Wildfire, this is a multi-partner uh, um, project. Uh, through also, uh, through a couple of professors in, at, the, at the University of Alberta and Thompson Rivers University, we worked, uh, we worked with a group there to, 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 predict a, uh, to build a model that would predict a five-day weather, like using, the, using a five-day weather index, predict fires, like really, um, like uh, geographically, where where is it likely? Where's the where's the fire likely to start? And and we used a, a I, I'm not going to get into the technology because I would really blow it. Um, but we used a, a variety of really novel approaches. Like this is fire prediction, not new. This approach to uh, this approach to it be really really improved the uh, the actual um, the actual predictions, the reliability of those predictions. When what is the likelihood of a fire starting in this location? And this location, and like these hundreds of thousands of locations, in the next five days, um, and that really enabled 
uh, even last, even as recently as last summer, the uh, the Alberta wildfire uh, folks to to really deploy their resources a lot more effectively to put firefighters where they were going to be needed before they were before they were quite needed. So, um, as we <laughs> as we have wildfire seasons like we did last summer, that becomes really really important. Um, so how does ever, how do you get started? Uh, down down this path. So everyone's tried GGP, GPT. That's great. Um, lots more opportunity out there to to get started. So I'll I'll just uh, make a couple of plugs here. One one is for uh, what we call our Executive AI Summit. It's a it's a program for executives and boards. It starts with some uh, starts with some some uh, a short workshop. It it includes a full track at our conference in May, which I'll talk about. I uh, encourage everyone to think about uh, coming uh, coming to the conference called Upper Bound. It encourages in, uh, a curated track for AI for uh, the a the business of AI for for boards and executives. Executives, um, and some obviously some networking opportunities there as well. Um, we do a ton of training, what we call ML foundations for non. This is for non-technical leaders. So this is for for you know the it's for product owners, for engineers. This is for product managers. This is for people that are uh, the people that are on the ground doing work. Um, and we we offer these we offer ML foundations the first and second Thursday in a virtual live instruction course first and second Thursday of every month. So um, we put we we put about a thousand people through that last year. We continue to to offer that, and that's a great starting point, foundational starting point to start to really dig into some of these opportunities and some of the some of the things you need to think about um, if you're if you're. If, if, if you're really interested in doing that. Um, the other kind of complementary piece of that, if you're starting to really go down that path, AI governance and, and ethics is another training uh, piece that we offer. Um, we go beyond that, obviously, to into um, into kind of we'll help you uh, hop, uh, we'll help you identify some opportunities uh, very specifically, and then we can we we are. Go back to what I said we, in, the, in the initial uh, stages. We are all about the transfer of ta talent, knowledge, technology into uh, into industry. We create a lot of that. We do that through projects like that project with ISL Adapt, like that project with Alberta Wildfire, like projects that we do with companies all over the country uh, to both move the needle on their machine learning adoption and their machine learning uh, their machine learning outcomes, but also on their ability to to access train, develop the talent that they need to continue to, to do this. One of the things about uh, machine learning is it's never done. When you start building models, you're never done. Um, there's al there's, you're always trying to, uh, to, um, to improve on them, and, that, it, and it, the, the core piece of the core thing, what you need to be able to do that is talent. Um, where, can you, where, can you, where can you interact with some of the top talent in the world? Well. Upper Bound, May 21st, 24th in Edmonton. I'd really encourage you to come. We've got a whole track of uh, track of programming about AI and energy in the environment. Um, lots of way more good case studies. Talk to the actual people working on those projects. Uh, get dig a lot deeper uh, at that point. So, thank you. I uh, hope that was uh, hope that was informative. So, hand that over to. I'll sit off. I can just. Say. Okay, hi everyone, good morning. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, I'm gonna be speaking about AI for the Resilient City, which is a program that we run um, uh, through Evergreen. Uh, the program itself has been in its three, three year course cycle, uh, and we're now in the fourth year. Um, and I'm very proud of the success that we've had so far, uh, which I'm gonna get into the details. Um, this is a program that's funded, uh, so the seed funding we got from Microsoft, uh, and then we have a continued funder through RBC Tech for Nature. Uh, we have a lead technical partner, uh, Graminer, which is a data science company based out of the United States. Um, and yeah, the overall program is led by Evergreen. Great. Before I get into the program itself, uh, it's worth sharing what we do as an organization. Uh, so we are a national not-for-profit. We're based in Toronto. Uh, we're in the space of transforming public spaces. Uh, 
to build a healthier future for the people and the planet. Uh, we've been in the realm of urban sustainability, resilience, and adaptive reuse for over 30 years. And what we've realized while championing some of this, these initiatives is that climate resilience is a core priority for a lot of municipalities across the country and across borders. Um, hence, that led to the birth of the program, which is called AI for the Resilient City. Uh, through the program, we've built a scalable data visualization and analytics tools that allows government stakeholders to recognize the areas that are most impacted through the effects of urban heat island. Um, with an ability to provide uh, for the right investment decisions, policy decisions, data-driven decisions to advance some of their adaptation and climate resilience interventions at the local level um, and also have the greatest benefit to the community in terms of public planning and public infrastructure. This tool uh, can also be replicated uh, by any municipality uh, using open source data set uh, to advance some of their climate resilience interventions. And I'm going to be talking about two cases that we've developed in the course or, or the life cycle of this program. One is a combination of using open source and proprietary data sets, while the other is sol solely open sourced. Um, so that's that's definitely, it's got its pros and cons, uh, and, and the usability is very different in both cases, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, but before I go there, just to provide you a bit of overview of what the application is all about. So it helps to identify the urban heat island hotspots within an area or region to support data-driven decision making, like I said. It helps to explore the relationship between public um, with, with the built-up infrastructure and the different typologies. So it explores uh, built-up height, old and new buildings, uh, pervious versus impervious services, the typology of buildings, whether they're residential, commercial, industrial, recreational, etc. It helps you to draw comparisons uh, between the heat variation in relation to what's really on the ground. So whether they're natural assets, green spaces, uh, open built infrastructure, um, it also helps to relate population density to the UHI within uh, the area or region at a ward level. Um, and it also provides insight into the vegetation healthiness of that area, uh, which is done through the normalized vegetation index that we've uh, calculated um, and, and built through the application. Um, but I would say one of the most interesting um, detail of this program is really when we came to the machine learning algorithm, so hence the AI within the AI for Resilient City, is we built uh, and developed this algorithm to de determine the changes over time, so over a period of one to five years, uh, using custom variables. So we would change uh, or flip population density, uh, vegetation index, uh, built up uh, with different uh, numbers that are associated across the areas and region at a census tract level and it will throw you uh, and it'll, it'll sort of pop up what impact it draws for the UHI within that area over the course of the next five years. Um, and, and I think something that's worth mentioning also is that any of the heat maps that are generated through the application can be integrated in any geospatial tool because they're built on API interface. Um, so we had a phased approach. Uh, our pilot was actually with the city of Calgary uh, together in collaboration with Gramina where we developed this application um, and, and that's just a, a look and feel and in, you'll see that in the next phase as well is how we sort of created multi-layered data sets and we sort of visualized that um, to help the city uh, inform some of their climate interventions um, at the local level. The second phase was with Region of Peel, uh, which encapsulates the two most populated cities uh, across Ontario, Mississauga and Brampton, uh, also Caledon, but these two cities being phenomenally high uh, from a density standpoint and also facing uh, very high impacts of extreme heat, particularly UHI. Um, so we did this together in collaboration with Toronto and Region Conservation Authority, uh, of course our lead technical partner Gramina uh, and Evergreen. Uh, um, and sort of try to advance some of their resilience planning uh, on the way. 
Uh, I just want to take you, to, and I'm not going to do a demonstration really, but if that's uh, on the cards, I'm happy to follow up and, and share more about the application. But I do want to give a bit of deep dive into what uh, does the interface look like. Uh, so there are four modes um, that we offer through the application, and there, there, so there, there are two active applications, one with the city of Calgary, one with the region of Peel. Uh, both have uh, a story mode, which is more of a story storytelling experience that we offer through easily digestible stories. Um, so it'll tell you things like, you know, which is the ward that has the highest temperature, which is the ward that has the lowest temperature, what's the differentiation, um, you know, what was the highest temperature uh, over the course of 10 years. Uh, so it'll throw those um, digestible stories that you can refer to and, and reference to when you're sort of building your resilience planning. Um, and, and what you'd see in terms of data insights would be like heat temperature, in infrastructure, demographics, etc. The most user-friendly, something that cities are actually using very actively, um, is the explore mode, which is nothing but an exploration. So it will represent the data as is, um, and the historical context as is. So we have, currently we have the data set from 2013 up until 2022, and now we're looking to update that um, as we're now going in the next phase of our program. Um, and it sort of shows the UHI heat index um, over the course of that cycle. The compare mode is very interesting because through this, you can actually draw comparisons of two or more variables at one given point of time or over the course of a different time. So for example, um, in the infographic above, the heat map can be compared to the built up infrastructure. Um, and in the infographic below, you can uh, sort of compare the heat maps over the course of 2015 to 2022. Um, so it sort of gives you a, a real insight into what's really on the ground and what's causing the heat temperatures to increase uh, incrementally. And something that we just experimented with, which is the scenario mode. So we don't have this application with the city of Calgary, but with region of Peel, this is very active and using um, and, hi and highly being used, uh, which is where the machine learning algorithm um, is used in real time to determine changes in an area or region when we input custom variables. Um, and it shows you the expected change in UHI for that area. I do want to talk a little bit about um, some of the impacts that have had uh, with the cities. So, with the, and, and it's it's vastly different uh, for both the applications. So, with the city of Calgary, they've been using the application actively for um, assessing climate risk profiles uh, across all neighborhoods. So, the information really helped them to identify where the, the, does the city need to prioritize the location of shading and cooling amenities, uh, and also setting higher standards for street trees uh, and cooling in the warmest areas. Uh, it did help with planning 10 public infrastructure programs and planning proposals. Uh, it dem demonstrated the effect of paved surfaces, uh, so the effect of roads and paved surfaces uh, on heat, with the highest temperature particularly being in parking lots and rooftops. Um, and like I said, it demonstrated the cooling effect uh, of parks and natural assets that can help to reduce the UHI within that area. I think something that we're very proud of is uh, we, we were in this cycle of two and a half years with the city of Calgary, um, and it did take us time uh, to get there because of the use of proprietary and open source data set. And they've now replicated the application to, to build their own version, which they're now integrating and using for different purposes with their climate change team, with their public infrastructure team, with the planning team, um, for direct integration into their GIS proposals. Um, so, and, and, I, and we think that's a big win, because uh, the idea for us was to pilot, experiment, demonstrate this is possible, and for the city to actually adopt it, use it, and, and see how they can, they can really advance their resilience efforts. Um, with the region of Peel, uh, they are more into driving assessment frameworks. So they've used the application to drive vulnerability risk assessments um, and frameworks. So climate change risk, uh, financial planning, urban forestry initiatives, green inventory uh, management plans, forest management plans, um, and, and a whole list of initiatives that you see on the slide. Um, and, it, and it's really to draw from um, 
the fact that we've actually been one year into the application with Region of Peel and now it's more monitoring and evaluation and enhancement of the application itself as they preface a lot on social vulnerabilities. So the idea in this next phase is to grow uh, and integrate layers of social demographics and really try to help the region identify which are the vulnerable populations within the areas at a ward census tract level. Um, and that's really it. Uh, I guess for us, where we are headed in the next direction is we want to scale up uh, and we want to build a public facing version of the application um, and draw insights more from across the country. Uh, and we're also looking to scale to two new municipalities while also enhancing the current applications for the use and benefit of the cities and the regions. Um, and yeah, uh, Chelsea and myself, I have my colleague here, Senior Manager of Partnerships and Outreach uh, from Evergreen. Uh, we're here to respond to any questions that you may have or would love to follow up and chat. Thanks a lot. And I'll hand it over to Leroy. Uh, thank you guys, that was fantastic. Um, uh, Zoya, it was really interesting seeing your research uh, when um, I had that uh, little video by Mustafa. He talked about um, AI becoming a research partner. So it's really neat to see that actually um, coming to fruition in your work. And from Russ's presentation, I think what really um, uh, stood out for me is when he talked about that kind of explosion that we had in the 80s in software development. And we're seeing that now with the tools and AI. 18 months ago, there were zero chat GPT users. Now there's 100 million. And um, large language models, I, I, I bet you in two years it's gonna be in the billions because not only do we have products like Microsoft Copilot, which will be introduced to Microsoft Office, but you're gonna have a large language model accessible on your phone in a year or two to help you with all your tasks. So this explosion is incredible. So um, now I had some questions for these guys, but I actually, have, we have about 10 minutes left. I'd like to open it up to you. Um, uh, we've got a great panelist here. But we have some questions already starting right here. Uh, uh, well, Mike's coming your way. Uh, oh, great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just, um, I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion on um, skilled workforce displacement with, with AI. You know, so you look at, I mean, if you go back when you had an industrial revolution and lower skilled labor positions were displaced by, you know, manufacturing and streamlining. Uh, most recently you would see, like, whether it's uh, pay at the pump or self-checkouts and uh, online banking and so on and so forth. And so with, with AI, I mean, it's absolutely brilliant and I'm blown away by the, the, the things that you can do with it. Um, but there are, you know, some of those consequences of making your companies more streamlined is that, like, you, we're, we're going to see a displacement in the workforce. And actually, I'd be curious to get both of your opinions on that. Want me to Go ahead. Start there. Um, yeah. So obviously, it's top of mind for a lot of lot of people, right? Um, and there's you know, historically, as you 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 point out. Um, Jo like jobs that exist now didn't exist five years ago. Jobs that existed five years ago didn't exist ten years ago. Jobs that will be in in will be the jobs of five years from now don't exist now. Um, and that like we'll never get away from that that particular trend ov overall. Um, now, what I would say is that kind of certainly in the like there's a transition piece that 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 we need to do. That's like so AI literacy for this entire workforce that we have right now is crucial to to to, to the being able to develop into those uh, into those jobs. AI education is is crucial to, to, to that. I use those two uh, two intentionally different uh, different uh, topics. Um, I would say. Um, in the in this kind of medium medium term, I don't think uh, like certainly some jobs will be displaced by by AI. Like it, in most of those jobs are jobs that um, that are kind of dangerous jobs or, or or very or very very low paying jobs. Like using robots to do, to to go into nuclear power plants is is probably better than sending people in there, which is what we used to have to do, right? Um, and and be able to operate autonomously within uh, within there as a as an example, um, but I think what the your 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 job is unlikely to be just dis like di displaced by a by AI, but you might be displaced by somebody doing a similar job that is using AI um, in in that in that regard. So I would encourage everybody in the room to to to. 
to really learn a lot more about that, uh, about the opportunities that are in front of them for their jobs and how, uh, you know, everyone's going to need to continue to develop, like, do develop their skill sets, and AI is going to just be part of that. So. Yeah, and uh, so uh, did you want to just comment on yeah, that as please, well? Please do. Sure. Uh, I guess I was going to say I think that displacement has already started. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing that in a lot of different sectors. But having said that, I think there's a real opportunity for growth yeah. and momentum. Um, I guess Russ pointed out very correctly, uh, before we actually had technology, a lot of those jobs looked very different. When technology came in, we all started like, this is something new. It's, it's you know, there's, there's an element that can bring efficiency in your work. Um, so I think in, in one part, you can look at it as being fearful of AI, but I think there's another element to say what's on the horizon. Um, and I think that is very interesting for me. Because um, I'd be also very curious, you know, is my job going to be there in the next 10 years? I don't know. But would I, will I evolve? I think so. So I think it's, it's for us to be literate, to be educated, to know what's possible out there. Because AI does not only mean analytics and algorithms. There, there is so much more efficiency that AI can bring. Um, and I think uh, somewhere in the news I was reading the other day, um, and, and the person was referring to every industry being a tech industry. I don't think I would have thought it. 20 years back, maybe when I was in my grad school. Uh, so, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's an evolution and it's a good moment in time to actually reflect on what's possible and what's not. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Just as a side comment, those are two of probably the best answers I've received at a conference in recent memory. <laughs> good <laughs> Thank job. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Uh, one over here. Uh, Harvey has a question. And as a French-speaking native, I thankful that Eco Impact has stepped up its game with Wordly mm -hmm. this year, AI Power. Merci, Gail. Yeah. This is for Zoya. You have the graph there of Peel and Calgary showing hot spots, maybe what could be done with it, maybe deciduous trees or urban planting. Have you guys done the opposite? Cold spots, we're above the 49th parallel here, like places that might be more inclined to minus 30 and how we could reduce it to a warming minus 20? <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, that's, that's interesting that you said it. Uh, but I think a lot of what we drive through the application is through the priorities of the regions. So when we do consultations with cities and regions to get them on board with the applications, we actually want to understand what are their priorities. Where do they want to? What do they want to achieve uh, from helping us build them uh, this this tool? Uh, and in, you know, where do you see yourself going into this? And we're having, for example, now when we're in this next phase and we want to scale up, um, it's not necessary that uh, you know ca you know we have a similar use case like Calgary with Halifax or with Fredericton uh, or with Vancouver. I guess every city and region has a very different priority um, and that's what we're trying to figure out. Somebody asked me the other day, are you also doing natural hazard mapping? Is that something that's on your radar? For sure, if the data is available, uh, let's get into it. It's, it's also something that's difficult to pull when open source data sets are not most user friendly. Um, when you have that raw data and to actually store it, compute it, process it, it takes a lot of resource. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's all to say. I think it's, it's more about what the cities really want. Uh, what are the climate priorities that they're looking to address? Um, and, and we sort of follow that. Um, so if that request comes in, I, I'd be very curious. <laughs> Thank you, Zoya. Uh, Brian, I think you had a question there. Thanks very much. Uh, really, really good information. I was just curious about how both of you feel about the whole security piece uh, of AI, not from the perspective, I guess, of um, you know how secure the platform is, but the information that's coming in and, and how you clean it and scrub it, and you know, holding that data and making sure it's correct. Thank you. Oh my, that's a that's a conversation <laughs> for, uh, for 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 a, a long time. Um, it's critical. So both security around uh, around around data is critical. It's privacy and security around pr pr personal personal data is especially uh, critical. Um, from a you know, from a corporate 
uh, from a corporate point of view, protecting like protecting your your assets has always been a been been an important uh, an, an important piece. Um, I'd, I'd call out. I'd also call out like so. Whatever prompts you put into GPT and anything you put in there, um, that especially ChatGPT, the, the the public version of, of that, that ends up in the that that's you might as well put that on the front page of the newspaper. Um, so be careful about what you do with data, in term, including pr in, in your prompt engineering to, to, to try and leverage uh, GPTs. There are ways to protect those things. There are other models or other approaches that you can take to get, the, to get similar outcomes, but it is critical. Like that's, that's, an, that's a security of information, especially people's information, is, uh, uh, is, is top of mind for everybody in the uh, in the AI world right now. So, Zoya, did you have any comments on that? Maybe I think I would take it a step further because yeah. uh, you raised such a good point. I think validation is equally important. Um, so when it comes about AI is surrounded, I think, I mean, it's so big in terms of just being poured by more data and more data and what you can do with data. Uh, and you can definitely go wrong. Yeah. So I guess validation and evaluation of how you're using that data, what is it useful for, and he, how you can twist it and completely go wrong with it. Um, and having been aware of that is, is most important um, as well. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah, and I'll 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 add to, to that a bit, a bit more and say so. The, a big piece of responsible and ethical AI frameworks is very much about explainable AI, understanding why did your model tell you what it told you, um, and and that takes a whole bunch of uh, of work, and that is also about understanding your your data sets and 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 security around all of that is again critical to 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 the whole thing. So. Thank you guys. We could talk about quantum stuff for hours. But <laughs> and and uh, risks I, associated with that. I, I could talk about this for hours, but unfortunately yeah. we've yeah. run out of time. So I would just really like to thank uh, both Russ and Zoya. I think the information they presented was excellent. Uh, it was a really informative panel session. I thank you all for attending, and let's give these guys a round of applause. Thank you very much.